Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Dahlgren Chapel of the Sacred Heart. And we've come together this afternoon for the latest in our series of Dahlgren Dialogues hosted by our initiative on Catholic social, life, Catholic social thought and public life in our Office of Mission and Ministry. I'm deeply grateful to be with you and to be joined by His Excellency Archbishop Wilton Gregory, the seventh Archbishop of Washington. These dialogues offer an opportunity for us to come together in prayer, reflection, and conversation on the intersection of faith and public life as we seek a deeper alignment of our values and our actions. We have the privilege today of welcoming Archbishop Gregory back to Georgetown for his second Dahlgren Dialogue, and we've been honored by the time that he has spent with our community since his installation as Archbishop of Washington in May of this year. I'd also like to acknowledge Father Friedrich Bakina, Under Secretary of the Vatican's Congregation for Catholic Education, who's able to join us uh, today, having traveled from Rome for our event, and also Father Dennis Holschneider, the President of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities. Father Holschneider assumed this position this past summer, having previously served for 13 years as the president of DePaul University. So Archbishop Gregory, Father Bikina, Father Holschneider, we're grateful for your presence. I'd like to express gratitude to the individuals who will participate alongside Archbishop Gregory in our dialogue this afternoon. Helen Alvare, Pro Professor of Law at George Mason University. John Carr, the Director of our Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. Kim Daniels, the initiative's associate director who will moderate the conversation, and Father Mark Bosco, our Vice President for Mission and Ministry, who will offer reflections on the prayerful context for today's convening in just a moment. Our dialogue this afternoon, The Francis Factor Today, presents an opportunity to consider the six years since Francis became Pope. In this time, the Holy Father has modeled and embraced a commitment to Catholic social thought a tradition that goes back centuries and in its modern form spans the period of Pope Leo XIII in the late 19th century with the encyclical Rerum Novarum, continuing today with the contributions from Pope Francis, particularly his important encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. We find within this tradition resources to respond to the challenges of our time to the demands of justice. The Holy Father has enlivened our engagement with the ideas of Catholic social thought, creating new opportunities for reflection and action. This past weekend was the third annual World Day of the Poor, an initiative he established in order to engage our global community around issues of poverty and inequality. And the message marking this occasion just last week, he reminded us of our interconnectedness, our shared journey as a people, saying that, quote, in closeness to the poor, we realize we are one people spread throughout many nations and called to ensure no one is a stranger or outcast, close quote. When we see ourselves as one people, when we pursue our lives toward the benefit of our neighbors, when we work in support of the marginalized among us, we express our solidarity. As we come together today, we could not be more honored to have Archbishop Gregory with us. At an earlier gathering this past summer, which focused on the challenges facing our church, Archbishop Gregory joined us and spoke with the urgency of our responsibilities to one another. And I quote, we must focus on what we can do together to move forward from words to action, close quote. It is in this spirit that we gather today and that we celebrate the tradition of Catholic social thought that animates our work. I look forward to the perspectives and experiences that our panelists will share and, and again wish to thank each of them for joining us. And now I'd like to invite Father Mark Bosco to offer some words of reflection and prayer. Good evening. Let me add my own warmest welcome to President DeJoyas and a special welcome to Archbishop Wilton Gregory, 
who had joined us for a Dahlgren Dialogue on Racism in 2017 when he was still the Metropolitan of the Atlanta Diocese. So welcome back, Archbishop. Pope Francis has underlined in his pontificate the importance of dialogue for our spiritual and civic formation, noting that, quote, dialogue does not only serve to prevent and resolve conflicts, but it is a way to bring out the values and virtues that God has written in the heart of every human person, closed quote. And so with these Dahlgren dialogues, we hope that a conversation in the midst of this chapel of the sacred heart of Jesus might offer us a prayerful posture to engage in political, academic, and spiritual conversations. Framing these dialogues within a place of prayer can sustain and empower us to bring out those values and those virtues that Pope Francis invites us to today. Our mission is the transformation of the whole person from ignorance to understanding, from isolation to dialogue, from indifference to moral responsibility, a formation that characterizes the best of what a Jesuit education like Georgetown has to offer. And so we always begin our dog and dialogues in prayer. And for this opening prayer, I just ask you to remain seated. Let us pray. God of all creation, send your spirit upon us as we enter more fully into the invitation of Pope Francis to share the good news of Jesus Christ in the challenges that we face in our world and in our church. Bless us with a spirit of dialogue, a spirit of encounter, a spirit of reconciliation. Grant us the grace to turn away from sin and live in the hope awakened in us by Christ. We ask this all in that same gracious spirit that sustains us. Amen. And now it is my pleasure to invite our panelists to come up and as well to introduce our Associate Director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought, Kim Daniels, who will moderate our dialogue this evening. Kim joined Georgetown's initiative in 2018 after years of working at the USCCB as a spokesperson for Cardinal Dolan. In 2016, Kim was appointed by Pope Francis as a member of the Vatican Dicastery for Communication, and she has been an advisor to the US bishops and to Catholic organizations on issues concerning immigration, human life and dignity, religious liberty, and care for creation. Please help me welcome Kim, who will introduce our distinguished panel of guests. Thank you very much, Father Mark. Thank you, President DeJoya, as well, for that uh, wonderful set of remarks. Thank you, Archbishop Gregory, for being here with us today. We are really looking forward to this conversation. Dogma Dialogues are some of my favorite, uh, favorite kinds of gatherings that we have because this is such a beautiful and uh, wonderfully prayerful, obviously, setting for these kinds of conversations. Uh, I love that. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Father Bosco. And it's my job to introduce our panelists here today. And I'm going to do that one by one as we go through and have our conversation. I'm going to start by having a little bit of a conversation with Archbishop Gregory first, and then we'll expand the conversation from that. If anybody in the back is looking for a seat, I believe there are some seats up here if you'd like to come forward. Um, so let's start with Archbishop Gregory. Thank you again for coming. Uh, you all, I'm sure you know that Archbishop Gregory became Archbishop of Washington in May of this year. You might not know that he's from Chicago, that he converted to Catholicism when he was in grammar school. <laughs> Um, that prior to this, as uh, Father Bosco said, he was the uh, Archbishop of Atlanta and also Bishop of Belleville, Illinois. Um, Archbishop has also uh, been a member, is a member now, of the Vatican's Dicastery for Lady, Family, and Life, and is just back from a trip to Rome. Helen was there as well for a meeting of this group. And very importantly for the work that we've been doing and so many have been doing on the clergy sexual abuse crisis, Archbishop Gregory was president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2001 um, as the bishop's 
grappled with that crisis in that iteration of it and responded with the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. So he really brings so much to Washington. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Pope Francis. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit. We had this first uh, Francis Factor conversation some six years ago now. Um, I think that it's fair to say that it is uh, no longer um, the honeymoon phase for Pope Francis. Uh, the world and the church have, of course, changed in important ways. And we're in a very volatile political moment here in our country. Um, we're also obviously in a very uh, polarized time in our church as well. Um, so let me ask you your perspective, and let me do that in two parts maybe. And the first would be, how has Pope Francis challenged the church and the world? And how is he making a positive difference? And the second part of that question might be, how have events and realities in the church challenged him? And how has he responded? So let's start with the first part. Thank you. First of all, um, thank you for the invitation uh, to come back to Georgetown and to be a part of uh, another Dahlgren Dialogue uh, event. Uh, let me begin with my reflections on Pope Francis by saying that um, he inherited a, a movement uh, within the church uh, as it uh, affects the papacy. Um, it, it really began, I think, in earnest with uh, Pope John the 23rd, St. John the 23rd, uh, who put a very human face on the papacy. Uh, he uh, gave to the world the image of a, a happy-go-lucky old Italian grandpa. And uh, he did it well, and, and he was uh, obviously uh, beloved, much beloved, uh, John, the, the good Pope John. But then uh, along comes uh, uh, Saint Paul VI, <laughs> and, he, and both of them began to uh, set aside much, many of the trappings of the papacy. Uh, John XXIII was the uh, uh, pope who, who left the Vatican. Now, he didn't go far. He went to Assisi. But in those days, that was earth-shaking because the pope was seen to be a, a prisoner of the Vatican. So he, he got out of the prison, went to Assisi. Uh, Paul VI... Uh, put aside the, um, the tiara, the three, uh, the, the triple crown that the popes had, had worn in formal ceremonies for, me, for many, many centuries. He, uh, he got rid of the flabelle. What are the flabelle? The big ostrich feathered plume, uh, fans that, you know, the pope would come in on the sedia gestatoria and there'd be the flabelle and and he set aside that. And so there's been this movement to, um, to set aside the regal uh, dimensions of ceremonial uh, papal uh, uh, attire. Uh, John, uh, obviously, uh, John Paul II uh, became the pope who traveled the world. And uh, he, in a, in a very dramatic fashion, went out to, to, to visit his flock, wherever they might be. I think a pivotal moment for me with Francis was on Sunday, March 17th. It was a Sunday after he had been elected, before the formal inauguration of his pontificate, and he had mass at Santa Ana, the little church right out inside the uh, Porta Santa Ana, and he had mass with the people that were gathering for Sunday mass, and he did something that I think was, uh, for me, dramatically important to understand him. He came out of church after mass was over, and he stood and he, said, he greeted people. He did what most good pastors do every Sunday. He encountered his people <coughs> by shaking their hands and hugging babies and doing all the things. He told us by that gesture that his pontificate would be pastoral in dimension. And uh, it must have driven 
the Vatican security crazy because he didn't stop. You know, people just came out of church. And I think that's, that's a key factor of understanding his pontificate. He is a pastor. And he does, he, he, he approaches the papacy from that perspective. Not an administrator, although obviously he realizes when you say the honeymoon is over, yeah, there's some administrative problems that he's, he's got to deal with. And he's, he's acknowledged when he's made mistakes in dramatic fashion. For example, uh, when he went to Chile and he encountered obviously the uh, scandalous situation that was there, he had heretofore uh, defended what he thought was uh, legitimate uh, pastoral issues, but he discovered he was wrong. And I think his, his apology was stunning uh, because he said he had bad information and, as you recall, he said, I was a part of the problem. That was, that's key. Now, you remember when Benedict went to Regensburg and he gave the address and he made the statement about Islam <coughs> that created the stir, he apologized, but what his apology seemed to say that I didn't realize that it would have this kind of impact. Francis said, I had bad information and I have now become a part of the problem. So he, he's revealed his, uh, his humanity, his humility in, in startling ways. Uh, some of the issues that I think uh, he's had to uh, address head on is the curia. Um, he is a pope who never worked in Rome. And that is real clear in the way that he looks at the organizational structure there. Uh, I don't know of a priest that I have ever encountered in Chicago and Belleville and Atlanta, and now here in Washington, who doesn't refer to the chancery as downtown. And that's not a healthy downtown. That's, you know, the, the organizational structure that's that can be at times very insensitive. And it, it's, you need it, but occasionally it needs to be uh, drawn back. He has really uh, made that a keystone. He's going to, he's going to reform the Curia. Now, I, I think there are members of the Curia who would say, we beg to differ, that uh, we were here a lot longer than you've been here, and we'll be here after you're gone. But he's, he's gone about it in such a way that it's not just changing desks. He says, you have to change perspective. You have to change your viewpoint and how you're gonna be dealing with the bishops of, uh, of the church, the, the, the pastors. And we're in our Ad Limina visits now, you know those, it used to be five years, now it's seven, eight years you go and you, you report to Rome on the status of your diocese, what's going on, how, you know, how, what's the life of the local church like. There have been two such visits so far, and I was there with, uh, with Helen uh, while one of the visits was going on, the New York group, and to a man, they said, we have never been treated so well in the meetings that we've had, that the, the courier, is now approaching that much more differently, and that's because of Francis. So he's got the sex abuse thing that he has to deal with. Uh, in the years that I was president of the conference, I made 13 trips to Rome uh, in the three years because we were in the throes of the first, the, the first real serious uh, situation. Uh, I was told by courier officials who will remain nameless, this is an American problem. Then I was told it's an English speaking problem. Then I was told it's a, uh, it's a problem that is generated because of the legal structures 
that we follow, unlike the, uh, the European legal systems. Folks, now it speaks French, it speaks Italian, it speaks German, it speaks Portuguese, it speaks Polish. Uh, it's clear that the issues are much deeper than any single uh, community. Uh, but he's got to deal with those. And I think he's, he's trying to the best of his ability. So he's got, and the, the last one, the finances. <laughs> and uh, this one, I, I, I haven't had the chance to ask him, but this one must be the th one of the thorniest ones that he's got to deal with. Because just as he gets to the point where he thinks he's got a structure that will be, that will hold the, the Holy See and its financial institutions uh, to a, a higher standard, another shoe drops. But those are the things that I think uh, he's trying to deal with. Uh, and, and let's say, uh, let's, let me be honest, it's, he's learning on the job. He's learning on the job. Interesting. It's, uh, that's fascinating to me. And I, I want to drill down a little bit on the polarization question. Last time you were here, we've mentioned the Dahlgren Dialogue, and it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful gathering. Representative John Lewis, a civil rights icon, uh, Georgetown's own Dr. Marcia Chatelaine, um, and Reverend Jim Wallace of Sojourners, as well as yourself. And uh, we drilled down on questions of race. Um, last night, we had this very lively conversation with young Catholics down at Georgetown School of Continuing Studies on Pope Francis and nationalism and what that means in the context of a president who tends to fan the flames of racism and nativism. Um, in this kind of context that we're in, and with a pope who's tried to build bridges and say we're not about walls, um, how can his message get through? How do you think it, both in our political context and social context, and also in the context of a church that's increasingly polarized? I think um, Pope Francis is not the first pope to encounter uh, opposition. Uh, I, I, I know one of the situations that uh, Paul VI, two of the situations that Paul VI had to deal with, one included the, uh, the Benedictines at St. Paul outside the wall, the abbot there uh, was an open conflict with Paul VI, but you never knew about, well, it, the, the knowledge was limited. Uh, when Pius IX died, Blessed Pius than Pio Nono, it was in the the Italian Revolution uh, was still going on, and they literally wanted to throw his body in the Tiber. So it's not the first thing that was thrown in the body, but they they didn't. Uh, the 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 thing that I think makes it different now is social media. Uh, so the opposition now has a microphone that has no uh, volume control on it. <laughs> and uh, there's no, um, uh, the, the editorial uh, capacity uh, is limited. You, you recall this very city when uh, the, uh, the Nixon impeachment uh, was going on. The Washington Post had, still has, I presume, a, a very uh, high quality editorial board. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't publish anything that hadn't been vetted by the, the editors. And you had to have a number of, um, a, a number of people that, that had to review it. Now in, in social media, if you get up in the morning and you think it, it's already out there. And so uh, the, the Holy Father has, has to deal with the divisions that are now trumpeted, you know, with no control, no control. Absolutely. Uh, one last question before we open it up to John and Helen. Um, when you were here, you were here in June, we've mentioned, for our national convening on lay leadership in a wounded church in a divided nation, which was about the clergy sexual abuse crisis and how we can respond as Catholics and recover our voice uh, in public life. Um, and I want to read a quote that you, I want to read what you told us at the time. You said, I feel the need to apologize personally once again for the horrific actions of abusers and the awful failures of leaders in our church. I especially apologize to victim survivors in this room. What happened to you was evil, it wasn't your fault, and leaders in our church often did not listen or act to make things right. 
uh, it was a really challenging and wonderful way for us to open our conversation. Um, let me ask you a little bit more about the abuse crisis. How has that challenged you? Um, how has it challenged Pope Francis? What's been done? What does he need to do? Especially, I know you talked about uh, Chile. Um, do you think that experience really transformed his vision of this as well? And how about yourself? I, I think it did transform his vision. Uh, he's still working on it, though, because he accepted the resignation of the entire Chilean episcopate, and he has accepted, you know, they all submitted their resignation, and he has accepted, I think, about six or seven. But that means that there's, there's about 38 dioceses in Chile. There's 30 bishops that have a resignation on his desk that he hasn't acted on. So he's really got to figure out what's he going to do with that. Not everyone's resignation will be accepted, but he's got to have a, a protocol uh, in place to make a judgment on, uh, on what, what should be done in each individual case. It, uh, a good friend of mine is a priest of a diocese, <laughs> we'll go nameless, it's, it's, not, it's not important, but uh, when the events broke out last year, uh, both here now in my diocese, but uh, the Pennsylvania uh, grand jury report, the Vigano uh, disclosures, uh, I was talking to him on the phone, and he said, this is like 2002. I said, no, Bob, this is far worse, because this involves leadership. The 2002 events involved perpetrators, those who had harmed children. This is worse because this involves people who should have been able to address it ethically, publicly, openly, and did not. That's a worse situation, in my opinion. It makes it very different. Um, let me open this discussion up to the other folks we have here on the stage. Um, first, I want to talk to my good friend, Helen Alvare, and let me introduce you all to her for a second. Um, Helen is a professor of law at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Uh, <laughs> she focuses on family law and law and religion, and she publishes widely on those topics. I think, Helen, uh, I always wonder where you get the, the amount of time to publish as much as you do. Helen is also a commentator on the church frequently called upon on uh, national networks. If, it, if it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you're watching a pope being elected, Helen is probably on the TV somewhere. Um, she is a longtime advisor to the US bishop. She's currently a consultant to the uh, Committee on Pro-Life Activities and a longtime advisor to the Vatican as well. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, both Archbishop Gregory and Helen just returned from an important meeting over there of the committee on, uh, excuse me, the dicastery, which is like a department um, of Lady Family and Life. Uh, Helen, let me ask you, I mean, you've obviously been uh, really deeply involved in the church now um, through the pontificates of obviously John Paul II, St. John Paul II, Benedict, and now Francis. How has Pope Francis challenged you? Um, how, what has his impact been on your life and work? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts. Um, excuse my cold, I'm sorry to be distracting. We were on different planes and, and somehow his plane is healthy. And in my plane, we all got consumption or something. So anyway, uh, I just wanted <laughs> Yeah, right. I just wanted to preface my remarks by I always want to sort of open with a who am I to have these opinions sort of remark. You know, I I've had experiences at all the levels of the church and I try to be a good Catholic and I, I fall off the nice wagon about as often as most people I guess. Uh, Additionally, while I pay a great deal of attention to what Francis does and what comes out of the, the Holy See and the U.S. bishops and my own bishop and diocese and pastor, I still get a lot of stuff through prisms like you get, which are prisms that favor sensationalism, that use political language for what is not political. Uh, and I guess a final sort of aspect of my background is that I did spend 13 years at the Bishops' Conference and have consulted them since. Um, and, and in that time, spent time in every state but one, like 100 trips a year, with Catholics working on sex, marriage, parenting, respect for life stuff, and saw the wonderful, wonderful sacrifice these people made, largely for single moms, children, 
the disabled, the elderly, poor, and minority women in particular. And so I come from a perspective of, you know, I push back when this group is generally called either rigoristic or loving God's law more than they love God's love. So that's, I just sort of set that up as my, you know, sort of uh, my experience for 30 years of traipsing around as an adult in the Catholic Church. Um, that all said, um, I think, frankly, the biggest impact of Francis on me has been personally and as a parent transmitting that to children uh, and then also in my work, which is, you know, to make sure you spend a great deal more time with God and doing and listening uh, and a lot less time making plans to change the world. Um, I think of Francis's pontificate as an extended meditation on the Good Samaritan story. And he is highlighting who are the people strewn on our path right now. And that's going to change you know, over time with different papacies. And so his focusing upon the immigrant, the refugee, which is a huge fact of our life on the globe right now, his focusing on environmental despoilation, his focusing on um, the poor, his focusing on um, the unemployed, remember? You know, that, <laughs> that big issue that was still lingering when he first came in as a worldwide factor, and some countries haven't really recovered uh, in the same way we have. Um, so for me, he is a, uh, again, personally reminds you that don't try to do anything before you've tried to listen to what God wants first. So, you know, don't just be a yapping mouth about church or politics or issues. First be a person of faith. First be a person who can bring Christ with you so that people can be with you and say, oh, there's something to this, you know. He lives, he might be around still, like he promised. Uh, and then second, to attend to the issues of the times that are pressing with, with an open heart and mind and be less of a, of a yapping mouth about it and more of what is it I can actually do? Because we, you know, just talking about solving the problems of the world or what position or ideology or theory you're going to apply. For Francis, it is pastoral bent, which I couldn't agree more about is, is he, he's pushing us to, to be real and to be effective in our circles of influence, not just to talk. I, I'm glad you talked about your trips uh, around the country. Helen spends so much time going and visiting uh, small groups of Catholic who were, who were on the ground doing this hard work um, of living out the gospel. So often, uh, those people are women. Um, we've talked a couple times about the meeting you've just come back from uh, with Pope Francis. Um, and one thing he said uh, to you all, I believe, in your assembly, was that he called on you to open up new horizons for women in the church. Um, you've been a woman working in the church for a long time now. Um, What's your assessment of his leadership in this role? He's been criticized for it. Um, and what uh, have you seen a change over that time? What do you see going on in the future? What do you tell the young women here um, about your experiences when you see it going? And then I'll be looking forward to what the young women here would tell me. Um, there's a number of things. And I, they're not commensurate. They don't all fit in a nice puzzle. There's no actual perfect outline to put them in. Let me just put them all on the table. Um, one of the cool things about Francis is he's very blunt. And he's trying to steer this huge ship. And so he says big things. And a lot of popes have done that. You know, like John Paul II's culture of death, right? I mean, even the New York Times thought that was pretty cool to, as a modern meditation. Um, so he says big things, like about the role of women in the church. And he says them many times. And, um, and I'm glad for that because the ship has to be moved and it's hard to move a ship if you don't make blunt turns. So that's one thing. His themes, if I think of the characterizing the various things he said about women, um, he talks about women like men being in mutual service to one another, to the church, to the world, but not servitude. And he says too often the use of women has slipped into servitude. So service, not servitude. One theme. The other is he talks a lot about the church being a mother. I think this is less about women than it is about trying to highlight um, the, 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 the way the church should, should be. And, and so I, I take that as being less about the place of women. The other thing he says frequently is that we need a quote, a more incisive theology of women. I'm not sure that's really gone places. Somebody here could tell me differently. I try to keep 
attention on this topic, and I, I haven't seen something unfold in the last several years that could be put in that category. <coughs> and the last thing he says is about, you know, more places for women everywhere in the church. Um, so he, on the dicastery that the Archbishop and I serve on, you know, um, he's really made good on that by putting these two really amazing women, one of whom he like spotted at a meeting, reached out, and, and, and I think the word would be relentlessly tried to get her to come into the Coria. She had a good job. Um, and these women were amazing. We saw them operating at the meeting. The Pope even highlighted talking about them when he met with us personally. So he's really done that. And when I talked to Cardinal Farrell, the interactions between those women and Cardinal Farrell and the advice they're giving is different than what he's heard before, and the Pope mentioned this. That said, I would still say there is a lack of sort of comfort which have, with having women as sort of, as dialogue partners, is truly involved. Um, at the risk of giving a little offense, it's been my experience that for every time I'm brought into something and to work it from beginning to end and really think about the shape of the project, there's another time where I'm asked to dive in an emergency about something that has to do with women or sex or the family. And please verbalize this. Please write it for me, because it's really delicate. And, and you got 72 hours. And then could you present it at a, in front of a really hot, neuralgic audience? And then, hey, you know, maybe I'll call you next year. So, for every, so I think there needs to be more of an involving of women in an ongoing basis. The, I mean, there's one other thing, which is that the good news, and I see we have somebody here from CARA. You may know this better than me. Um, I did see a study that showed that in terms of you know, C jobs, right, women being chief financial officer or chancellor or you know, chief of communications or education or healthcare or something in dioceses, we actually have a better female representation than corporate America. So I never want to say we're starting from scratch. There's lots of dioceses, tons of parishes, and slightly more curial offices that have women in at every level being part of actually the whole enchilada. Um, so we're not starting from scratch. There's, women are doing all kinds of things, but we're not celebrating it enough, we're not verbalizing it enough, we're not putting down what does this complementarity at the chancery look like, right? And why is it great? And, and we need to do more of that. A lot of that sounded familiar to me too. Yes, that's my I, line. Uh, one, more, uh, one more question for you and then I'll turn to this guy <laughs> over to my left here. Um, you know, I, one of the things I love about you is that you're hard to, pigeon, you're hard to pigeonhole politically. Um, you, I don't see you as, as being in one party or another. Uh, and I wonder, when we talk about polarization as we do so much here, um, I wonder about Pope Francis's image of the throwaway culture, which I just think is wonderful and I think is a, a, perhaps a vehicle to get past some of the false divisions that we sometimes see. What do you think about that image? Is that something that works right now? You know, it should work. And I'll try to be brief here on this. I mean, the image of a throwaway culture conjures up both amazingly useful visuals and amazingly useful intellectual categories. Visually, it's everything from the site of a, you know, those dumpster sites you see, like when they're trying to tell you that we have to do better, you know, um, and the amount of waste and consumption, particularly in a country as rich as the United States. It conjures up images of, you know, people, 56 people on one raft trying to, to get out of a country that they're desperate for. It conjures up those horrible pictures that were brought to our attention through these couple of abortion clinics where they were boxing up fetal parts or doctors was keeping them in the trunk of his car or his garage. Throwaway culture pulls together everything. We are, we, we, we can visualize it. It also is an intellectual category about our lack of care for everything that God has made, whether, whether it's creation or, or the most vulnerable people or just human beings at all. It should be really, really powerful. And I actually do think that, you know, they used to say this when I was doing communications and advertising. You know, you say something eight to 10 times and people start to go, oh, okay, I, I hear you. You know, they begin to hear you. And he keeps saying it. And he keeps talking about the environment, and he keeps talking about the refugees with nowhere to go, and he talks about the unborn, and he talks a lot about the elderly, the grandparent, intergenerational relations. Eventually, the bridges between this ought to be established. 
with people, right? Um, at the poor, his, his lunch with the poor and the homeless. And I was just walking through St. Peter's Square. And there's the new health center, you know, that they've built. It's right there, right? Right near where you used to get just the, the, the stamps that you'd bring home to your dad who wanted Vatican commemorative stamps when you went, right? Now it's this giant health center for the poor. So he's making it real, but I still think people in the United States are filtering it through categories. And they're, they're like, you know, it's like they're keeping those notches about whether he mentions their favorite issue. And it's so unfair to say, if you're working on refugees and that's what you're good at, you don't have to work to take care of mothers in crisis pregnancy, but you need to have sympathy for them and support the people who do. If you're taking care of mothers and unborn children, you need to have sympathy with people who are fleeing from their countries with nothing. It doesn't mean you have to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, but you need to understand that what he's saying is true and Catholic, even as you may specialize in one or the other. That's sort of my bottom line. Terrific, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn to you, John Carr. Uh, John needs no introduction for most of you, but uh, let me give it a shot very quickly. Um, he uh, has been a leader at the intersection of faith and public life for decades now here in Washington. Um, now six years ago, I guess, you founded the initiative here uh, to build bridges across uh, lines in both the church and in politics to bring Catholic social thought to public life, um, to reach out to a new generation of young leaders. Uh, and in that time, I think we almost 80 different gatherings, uh, drawing just thousands and thousands of people. Um, before that, you were a residential fellow at Harvard, which I know uh, we should hold up here for sure, all the second best school in the country after Georgetown, maybe. Uh, and um, you've also served for 20 years uh, as a, at the Department of, I'm gonna get it right, I always get it wrong, Justice, Peace, and Human Development, a uh, wonderfully uh, small uh, brief there, um, at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, where you advised on domestic and international policy and led those efforts. Started out under Cardinal Hickey here in Washington. So uh, I know that when we were talking about this gathering, um, you said you did not want to be the moderator, you wanted to be a panelist. Uh, why was that? Well. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks for mentioning Harvard. Uh, when uh, uh, we told our family that Linda and I were going to Harvard for a semester, my son Tim said, are we talking the real Harvard? <laughs> uh, I'm not uh, the fellow type. Just want to say a word about my colleagues here. In 2001, I was a staff member of the Bishops' Conference. I was a parent of teenage boys and I was a silent survivor of sex abuse from clergy. It was awful. And in the middle of that, on a, with enormous opposition, Wilton Gregory stood up and said, we're gonna have review boards, we're gonna have zero tolerance, and we're gonna take this seriously. Nobody has done enough, he would say that. We just released a report on 10 things we have to do. But at that time, he was a caring leader and uh, uh, pastor, and we are really blessed that he is our leader and our pastor now in Washington. Uh, Helen and I are partners in crime for a long time. Uh, I knew, I was going to say rich and famous, but famous. Uh, uh, Helen talked about the throwaway culture before Francis named it, uh, so it's great to be with them. I am afraid we are losing the promise, the hope, uh, the priorities of Pope Francis pontificate by a focus on our old ideological and ecclesial battles. Uh, the Archbishop told the story of going to the parish church at the Vatican. It's apparently a sin to talk about what happens at the conclave. So of course Pope Francis called a press conference to talk about what happened at the conclave. <laughs> And he told the story many of you have heard where as the votes were mounting, in his words, he said, uh, the cardinal next to him, his friend, leaned over, gave him a hug, and said, don't forget about the poor. And Francis said, these are his words, that's when I decided I shall call myself Francis, a man of the poor, a man of peace, and a man of creation. I hope for a poor church for the poor. Some people say they're confused about Francis. There's nothing confuses about Francis. We knew from the first moment, the poor, peace, and creation. And when he talks about a poor church for the poor, makes me nervous. 
That describes a chunk of my parish, but it doesn't describe my pew. Francis looks at the world from the bottom up, from the outside in. And I'm not at the bottom, and while I'm not an insider anymore, I'm not an outsider. We think the world revolves around America. Francis doesn't. He looks at the world, he looks at the church from the bottom up and the outside in. We have been debating, obsessing over a footnote in a Morris for how many years? What most people know about the Amazon Synod is a carving that became a controversy. Not the ecological danger, not the threat to life and dignity there. We, I'm afraid, are letting old ideological ecclesial battles undermine the joy of the gospel and lifting up the least. Uh, people say they're confused about Francis. I tried to, for my class, I, and you better be here tonight. Uh, <laughs> attendance will be taken. Uh, extra credit for a good question. Uh, here, a priority for the poor, reject the throwaway society, care for God's creation, love in the family, justice in the economy, peace in the world, and mercy in the church. I don't think there's much confusion. How we do this, where we do this, with whom we do this, is all ahead of us. That's what our initiative's about. But I think we have been diverted from the essential message into a particularly North American fight uh, where we bring our old baggage and our old battles. Not that the question of divorce and remarriage, not that the question of uh, getting the Eucharist to people in the Amazon who can't have it, those are important issues. We have had a whole series of Francis factors. Uh, we've had big shots, you know, we had uh, John Allen, Ross Douthat, David Brooks, and one of them, my daughter, was here. And I uh, drove her home, and uh, I said, well, what did you think of that? All those really impressive people. She said, I like the woman, turned out to be Kim Daniels, the woman who said, he walks and talks like Jesus. That's why I like Francis. I think we are losing who we are, who Francis is, and what our task is. And that's a big problem. It's interesting because uh, you know, the way we started working together in a more formal way was at the 2018 convening on overcoming polarization that we had here at Georgetown. And we brought together just a remarkable array of, of established and emerging leaders um, from around the country of very diverse backgrounds to try to move past these kind of issues and capture the promise of Pope Francis. Um, and at the same time, I would say right now we're at a very different moment than even that challenging time. Um, what brings us together as Catholics? What do we learn there? And what's driving us apart in particular right now? Uh, let me start with what's pulling us apart. I really like what Helen said about people who feel they're being accused of something uh, when they're doing the work every day. I worry a lot of what I call pick a pope Catholicism. I'm a John Paul II priest. Benedict is my kind of pope. Uh, I'm on Team Francis. Seems to me uh, that's a way to divide us up, not to bring us together. When I was a kid, the question was, do you agree with the Pope, not whether the Pope agrees with you? <laughs> when you really wanted to put somebody down, you said, you're more Catholic than the Pope. Well, now lots of people wear that as a badge of honor. I'm more Catholic than the Pope. And then they put it on Twitter. Uh, the, uh, and I, frankly, I think people try and use Francis to achieve or to advance their own ends. I think they try and score points. I think they try and get clicks. I think they try and lift up their own visibility and feed their own ego. 
I, I come from the left-hand side of the church. I have lots of friends on the left. They say, I love Francis. And a lot of them are frustrated about the questions we've been talking about, women, about sexual abuse. I mean, I'm very frustrated about that. But part of me says, if, if you love Francis, join us. We'd love to see you on the parish council. We'd love to see you doing our CIA. We'd love to see you working with immigrants. There is, there is a capacity, I think, on the left to sort of stand back and evaluate when we need everybody in. On the right, uh, I, I'll be honest, I have been stunned by the resistance to Pope Francis. It is both more than I expected and less than it appears to be. Uh, I think it is strong. I think it is powerful. I think it is narrow. And I think it is located in some of our most important institutions. And it needs to be taken seriously when it involves real concerns about doctrine and passing on the faith. We can have a discussion about uh, pastoral style and priorities. I think there are factions within the church where this is not about those things. This is about ecclesial, political, and economic power. And some people, some people think that a pope who's talking about poor church for the poor, that looks at the world from the bottom up, that brings the perspective of a pastor who spent his uh, off days in the slums of Buenos Aires, uh, probably doesn't look at us, look at me, look at the people who think they're in charge as the solution to all the problems. So there's a part of us that say, we used to count, we used to be in charge. We used to call the shots. And this seems to be turning around on us. And so when uh, it becomes clear that the United States is a vital part of the church, but not the dominant part of the church. That makes some of us nervous. On the other hand, and I'll just conclude with this, I think the Vatican could be a lot better about understanding the church of the United States. I think they spent, not the Pope, he doesn't know Twitter from Twatter, but uh, there are some people who are sort of obsessed by the organized resistance. We're a lot more vibrant. We're a lot more diverse. Uh, the resistance to Pope Francis may be in a lot of places. It's not in my parish. It's not in my seminar. Uh, the reason we have drawn almost 25,000 people is because of the, uh, the message of Catholic social thought, but also because of the leadership of Pope Francis. So I think it is time uh, to stop pick a point, pick a pope, Catholicism, and remind ourselves we're one family, and we have one pope, and he's leading us in a good direction. Let me ask you this. Um, actually, let's open it up now for, for all of you, and let's engage a little bit on this, and then we'll open it up to you all for questions. And uh, students here, uh, first, you guys get first dibs on the question, so please, in a few minutes, we'll open it up. Um, let me ask you all this, and I'll start with you, Archbishop Gregory. John's just talked about the resistance that we see um, and some of the challenges that Pope Francis faces. And at the same time, it's not uncritical of how the Vatican has responded to this either. What's your assessment of uh, the resistance here in the US, how Francis has responded, um, the strength, the sources of all of this? Well, first of all, I think, the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, opposition to the Pope is not new. What is new is the, in, the level and the intensity that, that's there. Um, John Paul II had opposition. You, will, uh, you may recall that he set up that first meeting in Assisi, the uh, interreligious prayer service at Assisi uh, around the Feast of St. Francis. He got a lot of pushback from the Curia. They didn't think it was a good idea that the Pope should be there with Buddhists and Hindus and Hare Krishna. But first of all, John Paul by that time had big chops. Now, he wasn't worried about uh, you know, the resistance. But it, 
it was there and it was real. They, they didn't like the fact that in 2000, uh, John Paul uh, had a, uh, uh, an opportunity to acknowledge the sins of the church. You remember that? <laughs> he got pushed back. What's different, however, is that this is organized and it is, uh, it is well funded and it is prominent in, the, uh, in social media. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's scandalous, personally. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I don't think Francis is um, afraid of criticism. He's a Jesuit. <laughs> He's not afraid of criticism. But what, what does, I think, what does um, cause him headaches is, um, is the, the insidiousness of the, the opposition. Um, if you want to ask him a question and take, take exep, exception to him, I think he, he could handle that. But it's the insidiousness of, um, uh, of the opposition that, that I think is, is scandalous for us, for the, for the church. Helen, let me get back to you on this question, because I was really struck by how you talked about uh, being out in the country and talking with people um, in church basements uh, and all the rest. Um, do, you, do you find resistance in those kind of conversations? What do you find to be a reaction to Pope Francis there? Um, what do you think uh, is the strength and the source of, of all of this? And do you, how do you react to what you've heard? So, you know, my purview is limited. I have. I've made it a, uh, a habit to avoid reading political fighting about the church. I just, I, I stopped reading, it's a shame because I stopped reading most Catholic sources. <laughs> um, I just had to stop. It wasn't doing any favors for my prayer life or my thinking about what I could actually effect for the good. That said, I'll tell you what I hear. So I still traipse around. I am. I think I was away six weekends in a row this fall at various diocesan women's conferences or catechetical conferences, spoken at large seminaries, like several of them this year, et cetera. And on the, on the issues that I have done my scholarship on, so set aside church-state stuff, and let's talk about sex, marriage, parenting, respect, life. Among sort of the average person out there who's involved in this, um, who is usually a middle-class person helping a poor person to have a child and then find a place to live. That's kind of the typical. I don't know if you're aware, but there's like 3,300 crisis pregnancy centers in the US. I mean, it's insanely good. It's, it's kind of cool. The number of abortion clinics and the number of crisis pregnancy centers has flipped. And, and that's just a perfect little happening. Uh, there used to be like 2,000 abortion clinics and 700 crisis pregnancy centers, and now there's like under 700 abortion clinics and over 3,300 assistance for women and kids and families. So among these people, I, we don't really talk about church politics. They don't. But I'm a member of a couple of listservs online. And Kim knows what I'm talking about. We just, you need information, but there, there is a lot of infighting about it. Um, among sort of more professional Catholics. You know, people working in management or some other stuff in the church. I just find there's more discourse there. And I, I can make this comparison because I genuinely spend a lot of time with Catholics in the pews. Like, I still do. I'm not doing 100 days a year, but I'm probably doing 25 events a year with hundreds or sometimes thousands, right? Um, the final thing I'll say on this is, um, so I'm going to step way back. You know, in the history of like squabbles in the church, and now I'm taking the huge <laughs> look. You know, for like the first God knows how many hundreds of years, we're fighting about the identity of Jesus Christ. Then the next several hundred years, many, we're fighting about the Trinity. I mean, if you know even a little bit about church history, you know, and this is where we were throwing bodies in the Tiber and excommunicating one another, et cetera. You know, since the Enlightenment, we've been fighting over the human person. And right now, the questions, you know, human person in light of God, who are we? And if you want to put the sort of fights in these giant, like, 700-year tranches. And, 
And, and the issue of sex is like one of the main aspects of anthropology that we're fighting over now. And to me, the church is one of the last people who's got this fabulous depth. And I'm so interested in doing this right that I am writing a book on the subject. I'm trying to go back to the first couple hundred years of the church and finding out how our teachings about love that led us to be the first in charity. Some of that we were really giving to people who were non, not of us. We were serving anybody based on need. This was really unusual. This was very different from the way Greeks and Romans did charity, right? We were pioneering that, but we were also pioneering the, the, the format of sex, marriage, parenting, respect for life that we're still holding on to today. Why did women like the church? Well, they really liked our teachings about marriage. They liked the no polygamy stuff. They liked the no divorce stuff. They liked the husbands love your wives as yourselves. They liked the no infanticide stuff, the no abortion stuff. They really liked this. And I'm trying, I, I guess if I had a wish, I wish that Francis would help us to articulate this for the 21st century more. We're desperate in need of this. And he articulates so much so well. And Amoris Laetitia didn't quite get us there. And I also wish, he says it lightly, but I wish he would cite why there is no daylight whatsoever between the love of one another, sex, marriage, parenting, respect for life, and the love to take care of the, the person who's strewn across your path, a la the Good Samaritan. I would like to have that for this confused time. I would like to bring that church teaching forward to the 21st century. He's so good at it in so many ways, but I think this is what I'm hearing from the upset, middle, chattering classes of the church, that they wish he would give us this too. So that's, that's, a, that's nuanced, but that's what I'm hearing. I love that, and I, I love it because what I'd like to ask, and I think I'll go to you first on this, um, I'd like to ask about Laudato Si, which is the Pope's environmental encyclical, and, and President DeJoy referred to it in his opening remarks. Um, and I think in Laudato Si, you find this idea of integral ecology, this idea of right relationship, that, if, that is a place to sort of launch from that. John, what do you think, why do you think Pope Francis uh, chose this issue? Why do you think um, he uh, has amplified it? Obviously, he's in line with prior folks on this, too. Um, and do you think it's, it's taken hold, had some purchase? Well, it's clear he has a passion for this because of what it's seen. What is remarkable to me is how he has crossed everybody up. He has said to Christians, care for God's creation needs to be at the center of what it is to be a disciple. And he said to people concerned about the environment, care for the least of these needs to be at the core of what it is to care for creation or for the world. And in so doing, he has challenged both of us, uh, the, whether it's secular environmentalists or Christians. Now we have a whole movement in the church. Uh, one of the things I love in Laudato Si is he talks about not only climate, my favorite thing, I did lots of interviews, they would say, talk about the climate and cyclical. And I'd say, well, it's not in the cyclical and it's not about climate. And he says, oh yes, I, I, I've read it. And I said, how many encyclicals have you read? <laughs> I said, I'm in a 12 step group for people who read encyclicals. I mean, this, this is what I do. And, uh, but he talks about workers and he talks about the unborn, and he challenges us. And he says to the rest of us, uh, we're gonna have to look at ourselves. We need a really long Lent. I wanna be really clear, the part about no air conditioning is not infallible. <laughs> well, let's take that right to you. I, I know, Archbishop Gregory, this has been an issue that you've, you've worked on some. Um, what do you think about it? Well, I have to go back to something that uh, that Helen said uh, about uh, the presence and the, the importance of women in, in the church. Uh, before Laudato Si was uh, issued, but while it was being written, and it was clear that the uh, Pope was going to uh, issue an encyclical on the environment, on, on uh, the care of, of our common home, uh, a wonderful lady in the Archdiocese of uh, Atlanta who was a professor at the University of Georgia in Athens, came in to see me. 
and she said, uh, Archbishop, I'm in the department uh, at the University of, uh, of uh, Georgia who, whose focus is on the environment and, and uh, uh, issues of ecology, and I'd like to help you prepare the people of Atlanta to receive this. So Susan Balarma, she, you know, she took it over with the, uh, with the faculty at the university, and they came up with a pastoral plan for implementing Laudato Si. And as far as I know, the Archdiocese of Atlanta is the only diocese that has put out a comprehensive pastoral plan on how do you receive it, how do you implement it, uh, both on the personal level, the parish level, the, uh, and the industrial level. Uh, I, I do like to say, in, uh, do you want to talk to the man in charge or the woman that knows what's going on? And uh, it was clear that, that Susan knew what was going on, and I was just happy to be able to say uh, yes. Because it, it, it is, a, uh, it is a, um, a pastoral theological statement that has to be filtered down so that people can, can, can take it and implement it. It's not, it, he didn't write it for just the industrialized world. He didn't write it just for the, uh, for, for the corporate world. He wrote it for the church. And I'm a part of the church, and I have to do something that uh, makes it real for me. And we're all called to that, I think. Uh, one more quick question um, for you, Helen, and then we're going to go to you. Quick question, because I think it's so important. Um, <laughs> Helen and I have kids about the same age uh, who are friends, and I think one of the, it's made us talk about before, one of the great challenges we face, right, which is um, great, the great gift of the church is our young people and the great hope for our future. And at the same time, we see uh, in our wider culture um, kids leaving the church. Uh, this has been an issue for Pope Francis. He's called the Synod on Young People. What do you see there as, as again, an opportunity uh, for us as Catholics and our challenges? How do you think we can take a next step? Yeah, I, so I have just a personal opinion on this, as each of you, I'm sure, in your own families do. But, um, and, and this is also conditioned by the fact that I fell in love with the writings of Luigi Giussani, Communion and Liberation. And, the idea that we convey religion the way Jesus did, right? You are a human being with other human beings who come to see that there is something about you that is just too good to be true. That is like, wow, if only human beings were like this. And, you know, he's brilliant. He confounds the Pharisees. He has no arrogance. He commands nature like this. He cries with the widow who's lost her only son. And they're thinking, and this is why you know, they say, oh my gosh, he, he must be the one. And the necessity of, and I've thought about this a lot in the context of the Catholic schools we send our kids to, et cetera, less focus on memorizing the dates of synods and, in, and encyclicals, that's <laughs> my, my new favorite joke, and, and far more on experiencing Christ and being, and I, I know I have this one son, and I don't mean to put in a plug for Gonzaga, but that's what I'm doing, and he had this teacher who just walked the talk he was Mr. Catholic Social Teaching. Uh, my son ended up working at the Catholic Worker. When he would come home and say, so-and-so is an undocumented person who's about to have a baby and they need to live with us and we have a spare bed, you know, then you know the only answer is yes. And, and part of that answer is yes because you're, you're Catholic. And part of the answer is yes because this is your son who's going to be living in the room next door and this is how you do it. And so... Um, I, I just think we're a little formalistic and not enough about being Christ to one another in our instruction or in our parishes. There's a lot of programs and plans and et cetera, but my experience, and now my kids are all in their 20s, was, and, and I think Pope Francis' blunt talk, his blunt action, his, uh, is, is the kind of representations of Christ that I'm talking about that we 
really have to figure out to incorporate in our lives. It's very radical. We'd ha we really have to live a lot differently than we're living right now. And that, it's very scary in that way, but it, I, think it's, I think it's true. I think that's a great place to open it up to you all to come into the conversation. Uh, please raise your hand. We have microphones on each side, and uh, and let's get started. Um, please, I'll say as as uh, we always say here, um, please phrase your question in the form of a question, uh, and also please, if it's if you can say it in two or three simple sentences. It's great uh, if you can say it in two or three simple sentences. It's right for here. If um, if not, let's save it for the reception afterwards, where we're all going to go in Healy, right across the courtyard here, and we're going to call on students first, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, John, and please identify yourselves if you can. Hi, my name is Ryan Anderson. I'm a senior here at Georgetown. Uh, so, where has Pope Francis succeeded in connecting with uh, young Catholics? Uh, and keeping them in the faith, and, and where can he improve in, in keeping Catholics in the faith uh, and bringing in more young people as well? Archbishop Gregory? Well, I think one of the things that he's, he's done to connect with young people is that uh, he, he's in the midst with them. He, he dines with them. Um, he's not distant. In, in some respects, uh, he's like grandpa. And young people like grandpa because he can, um, he can challenge them, but he doesn't do it in a way that, that's off-putting. Um, so I, I think that's one of the ways that he, he's uh, certainly uh, connected with young people. He's, he's with them. He's comfortable with them. Go ahead, Anna. No, no, no. Add to that. I, I think his, like, you know, in a huge media world, his gestures and his blunt statements, the visuals, have been really big. I mean, let's let's be frank. If you actually look at the literature on the transmission of faith, then there's a fair amount of it. Christian Smith at Notre Dame, a guy named Bengtiston, and faith and families. You know, really good studies. It's mostly passed on in your families, in other close institutions, in schools. Um, so to the extent that he impacts other people in your life, that he really makes an impact upon a teacher or a family member, but to the extent that you're really moved, um, uh, Kim and I both knew his communications director um, in prior times, who um, was talking to me at one time in Rome, and a, a guy called out to the Pope when he was zooming around the square in the little Pope mobile, you know, Holy Father, you're one of a kind. And the Pope stops the Pope mobile and he goes, no, you're one of a kind too, though, just the same. Like, those are the kind of, and this guy started tears in his eyes, like, this is who he is, right? So uh, to the extent that someone far away can, I think it's these, the visuals, the big gestures, the big statements that try to move that whole ship in a different direction. And you say, no, that sounds Christ-like to me. That's, that's really cool. That's totally sacrificial. John, you want to get in? Uh, Father Barron uh, gave a talk to the bishops last week about how to reach out to young people. And I was struck by the fact that he said, let's begin with justice and with social teaching. And that's not what every bishop says. Uh, obviously, it's sort of self-serving, but who Pope Francis chooses to spend his time with? Those images. When he was in Washington, I think uh, when the young immigrant girl broke through to hand the letter to the Pope that said, please don't let them deport my mother and father, that did more than the speech to Congress. Although as somebody who grew up when John Kennedy uh, sh shouldn't be elected to president because he'd take advice from the Pope, it was great to see the Pope give advice to, to the Congress. But uh, he left the Congress to go be with the homeless. And so I think it is lead with justice. He is an, an uninstitutional person in the world's largest institution, and my sense is young people aren't crazy about institutions, so having a leader that's not all that crazy about institutions either might help. That's true. I, I think it's really interesting to think about these images. Uh, there's a great one out today, and I encourage uh, especially you students to go take a look at it. It's from this uh, World Day of the Poor on Sunday and his lunch he had with the homeless. And it's a picture of him sitting at the table and a woman, a homeless woman, is behind him just like it would, like if it was your grandfather. Yeah. And her arms around his shoulders in a, just the most natural way and it's so affecting. Um, let's go over here. Anna, do you have someone? Please, please let us know who you are too. 
Hi, Savannah. Hi, um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. My name is Savannah, I'm a sophomore um, here in the college. Um, and I was really moved by one of the earlier things that Helen said about how we're called first to be people of faith and then to respond to the pressing issues of our time. And I find as a young Catholic woman um, involved in campus ministry here, I'm still growing in my relationship with Christ, but I'm still required to respond to the issues of our time um, in conversations that come up with other students. And I need to take a firm stance as a Catholic. And sometimes it feels like there's a dichotomy between me being a Catholic part of a global church and me having a relationship with Christ. And I'm wondering if um, just because it feels like I encounter Christ in the Eucharist and in the Gospels in a very personal way, and then I hear all these things that are going on in the world and of immigration and abortion and like the environment, and they're so disheartening. And I'm wondering if you have any tips on how to incorporate those problems into my relationship with Christ and how to use those to help me grow as a person of faith. Oh, just a tiny question. <laughs> <coughs> well, I'm like, 40 years older than you, and I'm still growing in my relationship with Christ um, in, a, in a big way. Um, a, a couple of things. First, I, as a person who's you know, been really active in the church, I'm, I am so tired of the words coming out of this mouth, right, that I am bound to want to swing the pendulum onto the other side and say, what have I actually done for somebody, right? What can I do for somebody? And to make sure that instead of making sure I have opinions on things, that I first understand, or first you know, love God and understand God's love for me and try to act out of that. Second, as a lay vocation, as a female lay vocation, to make sure that the issues I feel called to, and, right, and vocation is not only a matter of being attracted to something, but it's also like, what's the sad little neglected issue that people aren't working on and they really could use your help? Leadership is a rare commodity. You know, a lot of people don't want to step up. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, and so to be really good at that, right? To be, I used to intimidate people I was training by saying, you have to be the smartest person in the room on X, but I, I actually mean it. If you want to, you know, Etienne Gilson's, um essay, Intelligence in the Service of Christ, right? It's, you really do need to spend a fair amount of time if you want to help something by being really good at it. And that's the lay vocation. You know, I mean, the, the clergy, the religious, the, the vowed, etc., the ordained, are not most places. You've got to do it, right? And so, um, so I think it's a combination of really taking time to pray, um, Retreats. I went on my first seven-day silent retreat this year. I don't know whether to put a gun through my head or thank God every other day. The silence was like, Rawr, you know, it was just amazing. Uh, and I came out of it okay. It was good. I'll do it again. But just t stealing the time for prayer, um, reading scriptures every day, becoming familiar with the Word of God, and then, you know, s seeking out people who are Christ to you in this life and being that to these others, um, and figuring out what your vocation is and getting really, really good at that. There are these many issues that call for our compassion and attention, but you can't really help on all of them. What are you most called to? And then get busy getting good at that would be my succinct thought. Great question, John. Uh, just a quick thought. You can't do this by yourself. Uh, so a community, uh, the, the Catholic community here, the Knights, the Catholic women, the, the prayer group, I really admire the people who are willing to stand against the tide. Uh, Governor Edwards was a, is a pro-life Democrat who was reelected. Uh, Congressman Francis Rooney, who helped make this chapel look so beautiful, stood up on questions of character regarding the president. Both took on their party. I'm sure there are costs to that, big costs, but they belong to something larger, their family, their friends. Sometimes we feel homeless politically. We need to find a home, but maybe for now, let's just find a shelter where we have other people who can stand with us and remind us what we believe and why and give us the strength to challenge it. My experience is very often people's politics shapes their faith instead of the other way around. We need little communities, shelters that help our faith shape our politics. 
Archbishop Gregory, you know, with the last one, word. One of the things that uh, your question suggests uh, is that there is this, uh, and it's not just for young people, it's for those of us who used to be young, it's the dichotomy that we impose between our spiritual uh, life and our social justice activity. I, I often go back to the, the, the parable in Matthew 24 at the end of the time when the, the king will come and he's going to divide them between sheep and, and goats. And then he asks the question, he makes the statement, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was naked, you gave me something to wear. And neither of the two realized that it was him. They, they, they each come up with it. When did we see you hungry? When did we see you in prison? And I think that scriptural passage, is, it's an invitation to see that our spiritual life is intimately connected to our social outreach and love for others. Uh, even when we don't recognize it. Even when we don't recognize it. I think after this discussion, and particularly that great question, uh, it's entirely appropriate to end our conversation with song and prayer. Um, I want to remind everybody that we have a reception open to everybody right across the courtyard in Healy. Uh, and please join me in thanking Archbishop Gregory, Helen, and John. Thank you.